Hi, everyone. Um, I appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about different career and job options with HCI. Uh, HCI is a really interesting interdisciplinary focus and field. And because of that, I know that there's also different resources available to you all than there are to other majors and other disciplines. Um, so I'm glad to talk about the area specific requirements. Close this. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to talk about the things specific to HCI um, that you can use as you're thinking about internships and job opportunities in your career after grad school. Uh, so to start off, my name is Maya Irvin Pitella, and I am a third year PhD student in psychology and one of the graduate career coaches with the Graduate College Career Services. Um, I, along with the other graduate assistant, um, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations about resumes and CVs, job search strategies, um, networking tips, um, kind of the whole gamut of everything to do with career services we cover um, and all have information about how you can make one-on-one -on -one appointments with us. We also do workshops and presentations. Um, again, we also work with postdocs, but typically work mostly primarily with master's and PhD students. So, okay, there we go. So today we're going to go over three major areas and talk about networking. Uh, LinkedIn, and then career resources available here to you specifically to HCI students, things that you're all able to access. Uh, but I'd love to get an idea of which program slash which paths you're thinking about right now, just given that HCI is so broad. So are you master's? Are you PhD? Do you know what you want to do after you graduate? Do you have no idea? Um, yeah. So if you're patrons here... Yeah. Um, so this is my master's. Um, I'm doing the thesis option, not the capstone though. Um, I know I've, I've worked in product management before, so I'm thinking more either product management still or UX research. So that's where I'm going with it in terms of career. So I'm a PhD student. Um, so my background was in architecture design. I shifted to uh, HCI and um, I'm not sure how, but I try to have a job later as a researcher that I can bring my uh, like design background with myself. But right now my focus is research, not like the design, but the research, my passion right now. Awesome. Yep. And I want to go to industry, not like academia or- So make like money that. for real. That's <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> <right. laughs> okay, you guys. So I have a master's student. Mm -hmm. uh, not thesis, yeah. So my situation is similar to that. I was I worked in product management. Mm -hmm. uh, before that I was civil engineer, but my outcome is more like a product manager or product designer. UX, UI Very cool. Yeah. In my case, I'm the PhD program um, in the HCI, and I bring a kind of background in linguistics and educational technology. So I want to use as uh, Peter some of that background for sure to make it maybe different in UX, but particularly I'm looking for UX researcher positions. Awesome. Now it looks like we have some people in the chat. Um, so looking into user experience research or human factors, PhD candidate, tech industry, looking to move into academia. There. Um, is there anybody else in the um, online part that either wants to speak or write in the chat sort of where you're at, um, whether you're a PhD or master's and what your plans are post-grad school. Uh, product designer, UX research, not sure yet, fair, I vacillate all the time. Um, UX research design, instructional design, product design, really testing out my contacts. Um, product or UX design, something in tech, fair, product designer. Okay, yeah, so we're getting like a good variation um, on a theme. So lots of interest in UX, which is pretty common, but also that there are some other product management type positions um, 
instructional pieces. Yeah, I think that that's really interesting and I'm excited to use all of your expertise and your experience working in the field thus far as we're going today. Okay. Design engineering, awesome. Great, I was going to start today since it's April Fool's Day and like mm -hmm. having something like, oh, how to find jobs in theoretical physics, like as a joke, but like, <laughs> that's not that funny. But it looks like some people do have a math background. Awesome, love that. Um, maybe would have found it slightly funnier. So the first thing that I wanna talk about today is networking. And I really like that the chat allows us to do some of that, especially for people in the online program, um, people who may not be in coursework, um, the same amount as everybody else seeing people who have expertise in your area, experience in your area, and have similar interests is a great way to start networking. Um, how would you define networking? And on the online as well, how would you define networking? That's a question. Yeah. It is on the board, but <laughs> yeah, like if, if you had to describe it, how would you describe it? I don't know. Professionals uh, understand what's required in the industry mm -hmm. and uh, and the trend in a nutshell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think meeting people with similar interests, maybe exchanging what we've been doing, um, maybe taking it, um, making it something that builds more um, detailed relationships, like you know, uh, maybe mentorships or maybe something else. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Information exchange, not just uh, meeting people for uh, seeking jobs, but more like an interpersonal relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important distinction. So with networking, you do want to meet people and form connections, but usually the express purpose isn't to get a job with them at that time. Um, have you been at a conference or in a meeting and people start saying, oh, well, do you know of any jobs hiring or, oh, is your graduate program, are they accepting students? And you're like, I have no idea. It's none of my business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. So th the same is true for other people. Um, so when you are networking, it's not time to ask for an internship, a job or a reference from them right off the bat. It's purely to form a connection, form a relationship. And then later you might talk about that or they might bring it up. Um, but that's not the purpose of networking. Um, so, you know, you mentioned two distinct pieces. So the connection, so you're meeting someone. And then following up with them is really the networking piece. Um, and again, like you both mentioned, just going to make sure I'm, no, okay. Uh, like, keeping track of the chat is going to be an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so networking has a few goals and you both mentioned them. So you're meeting professionals in the field. You're meeting people who are doing things similar to you or things that you'd like to be doing or things that you find interesting. You might meet representatives from companies, which is especially important in HCI, especially given the strong emphasis on industry. Uh, and you're also learning from people about the professional world. Um, that might be understanding environments or cultures of work in different jobs or different settings. Uh, that might be understanding what a typical career trajectory looks like or what it might look like. And so being able to gain that field specific knowledge is super helpful. And one of the best ways to do that is through networking. Do y'all have any questions? At my heart, I'm still a teacher. So I'm gonna be like, so what are your questions? Mm -hmm. After hours like, but stop me because I think that I will annoy myself. Okay. So there are so many ways you could build your professional network. And today we're going to talk about a few of them, but one of the biggest pieces is LinkedIn. Whether you're interested in academia or industry, LinkedIn is going to be your best friend for better or for worse. So it's important to understand it. There are also resources like the International Toastmasters or the Iowa State's Emerging Leader Academy. And I think they're accepting applications right now. They just sent out um, information about that. We'll talk a bit about informational interviews. You might also think about career fairs, although the career fairs at Iowa State are heavily oriented toward the undergrads. Uh, there's still value in them and we can chat about that. Talk about industry visits, campus leadership and government positions, graduate student organizations, professional associations. All of these places are settings where you can be building and developing your professional network. Today, we'll specifically talk about LinkedIn, informational interview, and informational interviews because they're the most relevant 
to A, where most of you are in your sort of um, academic path and also based on your career goals. So again, and this is a question for anybody online or here in person, are you familiar with applicant tracking systems or ATS? What can, what can you tell me about them? So it is bit, it's a system which is used by the HR, mm -hmm. uh, human resources manager of the team. So uh, it scrolls the internet or the application which they use for hiring people, mm -hmm. looks for specific keywords uh, from a resume, whether it matches the right requirement, uh, basically. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so usually ETS systems are integrated to other assessment systems like coded by maybe HEC rank or something mm -hmm. relevant. So usually if you're selecting a candidate, you're also automating the process of pre-screening. System, I have no idea what that is and they've never heard of it or come across it. Um, but so like you both mentioned, so applicant tracking systems are uh, a program that are that's able to pre-screen and pull information and data about candidates to help with hiring decisions. Uh, because hiring at its core is a research-based decision. Uh, so data analytics and algorithms that are much more complex than we will get into right now are used to identify the most qualified candidates. Um, Workday, for example, is an applicant tracking system. Um, LinkedIn is an applicant tracking system. Has anybody ever been uploading a resume or CV online and it, all of your content gets really funky and it's not going into the boxes correctly. Yeah, that happens. So usually it's, they're using an applicant tracking system and uh, the way that your document is formatted isn't compatible with how they're trying to pull data. So that's usually a pretty good indication. It's also one of my least favorite things to do when applying for jobs. Uh, so where does that research come from? Where does the data come from? So industry recruiters are analyzing data. Again, decision is based off of research. Um, they're looking at keywords. They're looking at how um, both cost effective you'll be as an employee, but also hiring you. They're trying to make that cost effective. Um, one of the key pieces that we'll talk about is the, this idea of an ugly resume, um, which is essentially compliant with ATS. ATS can read it. It likes it. Um, it's never a cute one from Canva, unfortunately. Um, and then also, so there's been sort of like an uptick and a trend of recording interviews ahead of time as like a pre-interview. Have any of you had to do that before? Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Um, so usually um, after your, your resume is screened, you get a link in your email about, mm -hmm. hey, so you've passed to the next level. So take this link, go to this platform and take a one-sided interview. Uh, so once you go there, um, there's nothing else. You turn on your camera and you see your face and they have directions there. Um, so usually it's, so I think it depends on the company and how much time they give you. So it's, so my, I think interview had five questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, uh, and I had three attempts for each question. Um, I think I needed to speak for two to five minutes for each question. Um, and so the thing was I go in, so you can do a trial run where you test your speaker, your screen. Um, if you want to change something in your background, so you get time for that, enough time for that. You don't have to rush things. Um, then after that, if you select and choose to move to the next step so you get the you get the directions so you get like directions you don't get the question you get the directions and then they say okay uh when you're ready click next then you will get the question and you have i ha i think i had 45 seconds to prepare before i started speaking so they give you like a few seconds or maybe a few minutes so i had 45 seconds and i had to speak for i don't know two to three five minutes and if i liked it i go next if i didn't like it i try again so that was the whole process. So it sounds like it was a lot of work and energy. And mm -hmm. somebody shared in the chat that it was wildly uncomfortable when they mm -hmm. did it. Did you feel similar? Yeah, it was very uncomfortable. So one thing that um, sort of like there are different companies that look at like how applicant tracking systems look at the automated videos. Sometimes companies never even watch them. Mm -hmm. They use AI to transcribe them and see how you're using keywords that match the job description, um, which seems like a lot of awkwardness to put people through if you're not 
going to watch it, mm-hmm. but I might feel slightly better knowing people aren't watching me like babble, you know, mm-hmm. it's pros and cons, but it is becoming more common as again, um, companies are trying to make hiring more cost effective um, and have more data sources to pull from in their decisions. I think uh, to add to your point, uh, this was used in my previous organization mm-hmm. for screening or for assessments mm-hmm. using uh, linguistics, NLP, natural mm-hmm. language process. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more commonly used. Lots of uses for it. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Another chat. Oh. Yeah, systems can also analyze things like intonation and expressions. Again, it's good to practice, do mock interviews. Um, It's really, I think it's interesting to see like all of the different types of things that it can do and how that informs hiring and then also potential sources of bias. Um, Yeah, so here's a sample of what an applicant tracking system data report looks like. It's pretty overwhelming. It's also wildly aesthetically unappealing, but we're going to go through it uh, so I can kind of orient you to what we're seeing. So, and the glare in here is making it a little bit challenging to see the text, but I'm hoping it's better for the online folks. So up here, the top left, or kind of running down this column, you'll see that there are stars. And these are based on keyword usage and answers to questions in the application. So the more that you are matching the language in your resume, your CV, your cover letter to the language in the job posting, the better you're going to be. Um, when they ask you to answer some questions, maybe it's personality questions or like, why do you want this job? Again, the more you're matching keywords, um, the higher your star score would be. Over here, you'll see that your education is actually summarized into a statistic. Typically, employers can't even see your major just based solely on the applicant tracking data report. Um, over here, another salient piece to pull out these sort of um, partial pie graphs, I'm sure there's a different word for them, but when applicants have salary expectations that are over halfway, um, that candidate is asking for more money than the company either can pay or is willing to pay, and so that will flag them as well um, and might take you out of the running. Um, And one thing to consider, and this is hard, is that employers will focus on this output before they ever look at your resume. So even if your resume is amazing, it's really well worded, it's exactly what you want it to be like, it's well organized, they won't look at it until after you pass some of the first steps. And so if your resume isn't compliant with APF, if APF can't read it, um, it can remove you from the running before anybody's even had a chance to see how cool you are. So again, super important to think about making sure that your documents are compliant with applicant tracking. And again, we have templates of sorts available that you can use that we know are compliant with ATS, um, but we'll talk more about that. So one specific applicant tracking system that is most commonly used is LinkedIn. Um, And this is what I want to spend some time working on and talking about today, especially given the importance of using LinkedIn in industry positions. It's usually less important in academia, but if you're looking for a tech job, tech loves LinkedIn. Um, So a lot, this data was updated, I think it was from 2023, um, and they haven't pulled obviously 2024's data yet, Uh, but 72% of recruiters use LinkedIn during the recruitment process. And so they're scouring through people's pages, they're looking at their engagement, they're looking at how LinkedIn rates them as users. This could be a really interesting job for any of you interested in sort of the vocational and hiring components of HCI. Uh, Based on most recent estimates, there are 199 million LinkedIn users in the United States, um, which is, you know, a portion of the 900 million LinkedIn users worldwide, which has gone up significantly. Um, In these estimates from 2020, there were about 675 million users worldwide. Um, And obviously, a lot has happened since 2020. Uh, A lot of how humans interact with technology has changed since 2020. And this increase in the number of users, I think, demonstrates that well. Currently, there are over, there are about 60 million companies on LinkedIn with 15 million open job listings at any given time. 3 million users share content weekly. And so sharing content, posting, 
reposting, commenting on people's posts. People tend to be like really notorious LinkedIn posters and it gets a little bit annoying, but applicant tracking systems love that. They love when you're using the product and sharing it with people. There are eight people hired on LinkedIn every minute. And I think somebody submits an application less than every 30 seconds. And so it's constant and that can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming to see that, oh, like 300 people have already applied to this job. Like, why would I? Oh, like, why would I waste my time? And we'll talk about that and how those numbers might be misleading. Um, but, you know, this year, <laughs> this year, LinkedIn will be 21. Um, it, yeah, it's been around for a long time. Um, it's actually based out of Chicago. I randomly did some work with them when I was an undergrad, not in anything, like any capacity that was useful. I worked at a holistic health and wellness studio and um, everybody, all of the LinkedIn employees, they got like a discount through LinkedIn to come to us. So, but people love working for LinkedIn um, and we're going to get more into the nitty gritty. So show of hands or emojis or something for the online crew. Um, how many of you have a LinkedIn that you feel good about? You have one, you feel confident in it. Okay, love that. Oh, lots of hands. Okay, cool. So we have some. Awesome. Great. Love that. That's um, more than typical for these presentations, which is great. Again, love that for HCI. So we're going to go through this, but I would love to also hear your experiences um, as we're going. Oh, did Amanda, did you have a question? She raised her hand. Or, oh, okay. Just making sure. Uh, so as you're thinking about developing your profile, again, because LinkedIn is an applicant tracking system, making sure that the way you talk about your skills and the way that you organize information so that it's legible is important. Here you can see that somebody has a nice professional headshot. Um, I think my LinkedIn profile picture was taken with an iPhone. and But still, it's professional. You're not like at a club. You're not... Um, in sweats at home, just like laying on the floor. It's not your dog. Like it's, it's you. It looks like you. Um, background picture that's related to the field. It, this example, um, she's a PhD candidate in molecular and cell biology. So she has microbiology things behind her. Awesome. You can download these. You can make your own really easily in Canva. Um, you could probably make your own with other software and tech that y'all are familiar with, but having something that's a little bit personalized can really help. Again, just adding a personal element to it. Uh, you see that she has her name, of course. Um, and then in her key or in her tagline of sorts, um, this is a really great place to use keywords. So here you're going to want to communicate who you are personally and or professionally. Um, really, again, depending on the types of positions you're looking for and what you want to communicate about yourself. Uh, it's a good place to highlight keywords and skills that uh, are present in the rest of your LinkedIn profile, but really bringing them front and center. And it's also a good place to summarize professional interests. I recommend separating each piece in some way. Um, so making sure that there are spaces. If you have like PhD candidate bar, it's ATS isn't looking for candidate bar as a word, but it's like, it might be looking for candidates. So making sure there's spaces, but you could use dots, you could use dashes, you could use an M dash if you wanted to go wild, you could use a colon, you can do sort of whatever you want as long as you're differentiating that a bit. Um, do you recommend paying for LinkedIn premium? So it really depends on what you're wanting to use it for. Um, I have previously, but usually when they're like six months free and I'm like, okay, cool. Just because I think it's interesting. If um, I usually don't find it to be worth it. Most of the services that you get with that aren't significantly different than the ones you get in the free version. Um, if you get an offer for a discounted couple of months, sure, give it a shot. Some people really like it, um, but I think that you can still see plenty of information without that. Good question. Yeah. Questions on this piece? No, pretty much summarizing things you already know. Yeah. 
So in this headline, mm -hmm. and in my case too, I mean, quite a bit of like um, things in terms of um, keywords in mm -hmm. the headline. Is which one is more preferable, or is there is kind of like a balance, like having too many horses or versus just one? I've seen a wide spectrum of head, mm -hmm. kind of like headlines, very small, very short versus like this pretty long. So is there any kind of like a gold standard here? Less so a gold standard. The unfortunate thing about LinkedIn career services in general is that it's not a science. It's more of an art form. And so there's a lot of capacity for creativity and individual differences within that. Yeah. Um, mine is not this long. I think I have maybe four. Um, pieces of information. Um, I think that it's probably field specific. Um, and if there are like looking at people who have positions that you're interested in and seeing how they do it, mm -hmm. I love to copy other people's LinkedIn. So okay. yeah. awesome. Good question. So another thing to consider is how you include your experience. So this should be all of your experience. So education-based experience, work-based experience, you do not have to have been paid for the experience in order to include it here. Um, so if you had, um, if you're working on a project, like a research project uh, in school, you can include that here. Talk about what you did. Um, there isn't a need to only choose paid work here. Um, and so many times, especially people getting PhDs and leaving with a PhD, um, don't think about the value of unpaid work, although graduate students do a lot of unpaid work, but you're still getting valuable experience from that. So you're, you'll want your experiences to be in reverse chronological order. So most recent first, and then going back in time. And you'll also want to use a professional title. So we'll get into this later a little bit more, um, but most, recruiters aren't going to be typing like graduate research assistant and looking for somebody who self-describes them, who describes themselves that way. That was redundant. Apologies. Um, they'll be looking for, oh, like qualitative researcher or quantitative researcher or clinical scientist or UX designer or UX intern or, you know, like professional titles. So include that, include that you did that Make sure that you're honest. You did that as part of a graduate research assistant. You did that as part of a course, but leading with your professional title will help you come up in results more frequently. Uh, you'll also want to use keywords, action verbs, accomplishments, and skills, Oops, which is a lot of different things. So I like to use a formula for doing this, um, and that's action verb plus example plus an outcome. And I did not include this formula in the slides, but I can send it so that you all have access to it later. But essentially starting off with a strong action verb, so conducted, analyzed, led, are all examples on the board, um, followed by, so that's what you did. Then you give an example of how you did it, and then an outcome. Why was it important? Why was that part of your job description? It helps show the depth and the breadth of your experience. Uh, and this language must match your resume or CV. Uh, again, it will work so much better for applicant tracking and also for hiring decisions with companies. Uh, whenever possible, quantify your experience. So how many data sets did you look at? Um, what was the change in um, overall profit because of what you were doing? How much money did you make? What sorts of increases or decreases in good or bad things were there? Um, I add that with the caveat that I don't always quantify things if they weren't that impressive. And that's not to say that like your work doesn't have value just for the fact that it's work. But if you mentored like one undergraduate student for one semester, is that really necessary? Like I probably just wouldn't include that. Um, so thinking about how and when you're quantifying is important. Um, there's also on LinkedIn, there's an ability or an option to add skills specifically to each experience. So we'll talk about the skill section in a second, um, which is at the bottom, but then you can attach them to certain experiences. Highly recommend doing that so that potential employers know where you were obtaining these skills. Okay. Uh, one last piece, you'll also want to highlight recognitions. If you got 
accolades for something, if you got an award for doing something, if whether it was a departmental award or from somebody else or somewhere else based on your work and this experience, make sure to include that, right? Like this is your highlight reel of your best work. So include that as well. Yes, yeah, so for the skills. So the recommendation is that you're going to want to have at least 15 skills included. Uh, absolutely pull these skills from job descriptions. Um, exactly. You want to match that as well as possible whenever possible, um, because it will show you how well you are qualified or how you compare to potential candidates or other candidates for jobs based on your skills and experience that you've been put into LinkedIn. So this one can be a little bit silly, but if jobs are saying that they want Microsoft Office and you're like, I don't need to include Microsoft Office, obviously I know that. No, uh, not obviously. A, some people can't, which, you know, whatever. But so some people can, but also like really having it match as much as possible is really important. So I include Microsoft Office and then I detail out Excel, PowerPoint, Word, which feels a little bit tedious, but it can be so worth it when it's mapping on to job descriptions and when it's pulling you up higher in the ranks of LinkedIn and applicant tracking systems. Uh, also, though, be be careful. So if you if you can use Excel to like, I don't know, do an auto sort sometimes or like a custom sort, um, maybe like a few different equations, but not much, you might not want to say that that's like one of your top skills, um, especially in industry positions and in tech heavy positions, they will test you on it. So if you don't feel comfortable being tested on it, um, take that into consideration as you're going. Uh, there's also the option to rearrange your skills. I recommend choosing ones that are very salient and field specific. Um, so here, I included ergonomics, human factors, human factors engineering, presentations, proposal generation, task analysis, usability, usability engineering. So like maybe Microsoft Word isn't your top skill. Like and having your top 10 skills be directly relevant to what kinds, the types of jobs you're looking for. Questions about the skills? Pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also the option to look for jobs on LinkedIn. Has anybody done that? You've, have you looked yeah, a little yeah, bit? Yeah. You're like, of course, of yeah. course. No, I think it's super handy. And I like that if your LinkedIn profile is well fleshed out, that you can really find very um, targeted positions. Uh, so you can do this by people, by job, titles, um, from posts, you can do it based off of schools, location, your connections. There are so many ways to do it. Um, obviously you do it in the top left-hand corner. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to looking up by job title, using keywords, using locations. Um, so again, this is human factors engineer. If there's a place you really specifically want to be working, include that. You can also include remote work here if you're if that's what you prefer. Uh, highly recommend turning on alerts for new job postings, especially if your interests are more niche and there aren't a ton of jobs coming up in your area. Keep that on so you'll get an email or a notification um, when they come out. Uh, but again, this is what the interface looks like. It's pretty user friendly, all things considered. So I have a question. Yeah. When we do job searches mm -hmm. like this, sometimes it depends on the title that we use. Is this information kind of like at the back end known to recruiters or, you know, in the algorithm, yeah, we are looking for jobs. That's why we are searching kind of like, you know, uh, is it known to someone else at the back end in LinkedIn as recruiters, for example, or not? So can you rephrase? I don't think I was following. I'm searching for jobs. Yeah just for my own sake. Mm -hmm. And then uh, does oh, a recruiter know. know that I'm searching jobs? That, in LinkedIn? that you're like open to work? Not open to work. But just, just so you're so the, the kind of filters? Filters, it could be, you know, because yeah. whenever you have it open to work, it shows that you are open to work. Yeah. I understand okay, that yeah. it's visible. But at the back end, you know, in its algorithm with LinkedIn, if I do job searches, oh. does 
is it known by recruiters that, hey, this person is looking for jobs in this title, in this space? So I don't know for certain, but I would not be surprised if that was part of the function that recruiters have. I'll show a little bit of what the view looks like for recruiters in a few slides. Um, yes, so it's possible. And I wouldn't be surprised if recruiters were reaching out to you based on sort of like the searches that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't, I don't know for certain. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah. I can look into it more and yeah. yeah. Oh, they cannot oh. see you in the app. Thing. I have hired on LinkedIn before. Oh. So so you cannot like see what they're what positions they've applied for mm -hmm. just from the view that I have as an unpaid recruiter. But I, I think the you know, question is like say if 10 people are searching for human factors in general. Okay, for the recruiter, does it show hey 10 people have searched yeah uh, like for you, me, her and Mm -hmm. yeah. So then you go and look at this. This is that is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think I'm not. I, I haven't used the recruiter end extensively, and I think it's possible they do collect that data, but I'm not sure how accessible it is to recruiters. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, any questions from the online component? Just making. I don't want to miss any of you. So. There's also one of my favorite insider tips, it's not really an insider tip, is when you're looking for positions, it will give you a list of positions that people also searched for. Um, and so these titles can be really helpful both on LinkedIn to look by those positions and also on other websites like Indeed or Glassdoor. Uh, it can be hard to think of how to describe your interests sometimes, uh, especially a lot of positions involved in HCI can be jargony, which is fair. Academia is jargony, tech is jargony, HCI is jargony. And so trying to think of like how your position or your potential role could be described across different settings can be challenging. And so I really like this piece. Um, so uh, the search was human factors engineer, and then it shares that people also search for ergonomics, ergonomics engineer, usability engineer, human factors engineering, design engineer, maybe some HR. And so there's um, different searches you can try as you're, as you're on the job hunt. Uh, another big piece, and so I know a lot of you use LinkedIn, so I'm not gonna go too, too into detail here, um, but it's really helpful to look for connections or alumni um, as you're thinking about reaching out to people or if there's a job that you're really excited about and say it's at Microsoft. And of course, you're going to use every connection you can um, to either get an informational interview or find out um, more about the position. And so it shares when there's company or institution alumni, um, if you might know anybody, et cetera, look for them. This is a really great way to start to identify connections that you might make. Um, also, highly recommend always sending a note when requesting a connection so they know who you are, especially if you're at a conference um, or something similar. Uh, you meet so many people, so that can be hard to do. Here's an example. Um, so Karen Lawton Dunn is the senior career specialist with Graduate Career Services. Um, she put together this basic structure of these slides, and this is an example she sent making a connection between people. Um, a student she'd worked with previously and a current student to connect them. Um, so this is one way you might use your connection in the service of other people. And I can also, I will definitely make the slides available afterwards. So I, I always, sometimes I take notes like really quickly, but um, yeah, just so that everybody has them there, a handy resource. So here's a piece of what the recruiter view looks like. Again, a professional title and job title will be searched by recruiters, not graduate assistant, a postdoctoral scholar. Um, keep that in mind. So there's some um, there are some examples in the slides about what that might look like. So maybe you call yourself a project manager um, or a lab manager if you are working for your advisor and mentoring undergrads through the research process and through data collection, um, maybe project manager might be appropriate within this context. So here's a little bit of what it looks like, um, again, just for some additional context. So uh, can you go yeah. back here then, uh, maybe I missed at the beginning of the 
presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, then rather than putting graduate assistant or postdoc in our headline, is it much better to try to find a more professional title or is it? Yeah, so I do both. So in the actual experiences, I'll say like research scientist dash graduate research assistant, graduate research scholar, whatever. Um, in the top in the headline, I include both. As long as you're as long as you have something on your page that will help them identify that um, you have the experience that they're looking for. Okay. So with a professional title, that's sufficient. And then on your headline, you can uh, expand beyond that. Okay. Good question. So informational interviews. So like we were talking about with networking in the beginning, um, they are an informal opportunity to speak to professionals currently working in a field or company of interest. Have any of you done informational interviews? It's, it's an informal conversation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like I think they're so much fun. We I took a career development like one credit class in undergrad and I loved it. And one of our assignments was to um, have informational interviews. I met with this woman who worked for the State Department and was wild and gave lots of really good advice. And it was so interesting to hear how she um, approached her career trajectory and what her recommendations were. Um, and it was really helpful to gain that insight. Um, I don't know, shockingly, a ton of people who work for the State Department, so it was really valuable. Um, and you said you've done them as well. Actually, Karen helped me. Oh, yeah. love that. <laughs> yes. Um, so if anybody's listening to what I'm talking, book a call with the career services folks they're super helpful um so the the message that you saw linkedin karen so just like that karen connected me to a couple people who were um alumni of isu um so i so after she connected me to them i sent them a message and asked them if they were open for a call um so i remember i talked to two people um it, it was last semester um and yeah i talked about it um, so I was like, oh, fellow cyclone here, I'm, I'm doing uh, NCI in Iowa State, can I, so if, so I see you're working in this, this company, in this position, so this is what I'm aspiring to be in the future, so if you have time, can you please talk for like 15 minutes, um, and so yeah, I booked the call, I did the call, I think in the call I mostly focused about, um, you know, like what were their experiences as a student and what they recommend for me as a student to build my skills on or just like um, suggestions for looking for jobs or internships, things like that. Yeah, they were very well. They were good. They were yeah, well. they were very helpful. Uh -huh. And they were very insightful about, oh, this is what happens when we are hiring people or, oh, this is what happened with me when I was looking for jobs or, oh, if you're still like, and they also gave suggestions about, oh, you could like look into these things um, uh, if you're looking to upskill, so maybe check out. So for example, there was one person that told me, oh, look into AI stuff because a lot of companies are trying to hire AI people. So yeah, so that's such kind of helpful conversation. I love to hear that. I'm glad it was helpful. Of course, there's always the possibility that informational interviews will not be helpful, but usually when people agree to them, it's they want to help, they want to give back, they want to feel good about mentoring like future people in the field. And so rely on that, like use that. Um, you can learn firsthand about experiences in the field and also get knowledge that isn't available online, mm -hmm. which is again, invaluable and also gives you a leg up if that's something that you're interested in pursuing in the future. Again, it's not a job interview. You're not asking them for a job. Please don't ask them for a job. Um, that's not what the purpose of informational interviews is. It's really, it's really gathering knowledge. Here are some sample questions. And again, we'll send the slides out. Um, these are just like very general questions. We have a more detailed version. You can go off on it. Um, I actually had an undergraduate student in a course I was teaching last semester. We had talked very briefly about informational interviews and she said, oh, I love, I loved when we talked about it. I cold emailed a faculty member at an institution across the country and we met for three hours. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And so she's like, yeah, it was just like a conversation. She was shocked, which I thought was really funny. Um, but asking how they got started in the field, what skills or abilities are most important to succeed. Uh, this is, you know, 
it's been four years, a long four years, but how work in the industry has changed, maybe how it's even changed in the past few years. I like to see, I like to ask where they think the industry is going within the next five or 10. Um, if they have any additional advice or if they have any other people in their own network, they might connect you with. Um, that's something I do a lot when I meet with alum from like, or current students from where I went to undergrad. Um, I usually and often connect them to other people. So this little matrix is again, really helpful and will be in the slides, um, but this can be a good sort of brainstorming activity and thinking activity um, as you're considering the expansion of your network. So begin a list of names of potential contacts, uh, especially important for industry as all of my people with industry experience know who you know is just as important as what you know. Uh, so starting by thinking about like why it's important to meet or reconnect with a person. Um, what strategies are you going to use to identify additional contacts? And again, so contacts you already know, names, their contact information, usually like an email address. Uh, why do you want to connect with them? What your strategies are to connect or meet with them? And then thinking about people you'd like to meet. Um, and sometimes you can, I often recommend using your professor's networks as a vehicle to connect. I was at a conference two weeks ago. My major professor said, let me know if there's anybody you're really excited to meet and I can help connect you and introduce you. And I was like, perfect. So I made a little list and I sent it to her um, and it was really valuable. And so again, thinking about the networks that already exist uh, within HCI is a really great place to start. Okay, so last little bit, just an overview of what we do. Again, because you all, um, you're not in a specific college, it can be challenging to make sure that you're getting the resources that you need, that you want, that you deserve. So um, career services at the grad college. Um, so I have a link for where to make an appointment with us and you can also email us if you have questions. But like I mentioned at the beginning, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching, we do group presentations, we do webinars, talk about resumes and CVs, the difference between them, um, when it's good to use one over the other. We do interview skills, interview prep, mock interviews. I do a lot of mock interviews. Um, even for Excel. Hmm? Even for Excel. Oh yes, I do. So many. So. We have like area specific questions that we ask, but also a lot of pieces um, are fairly general across interviews, right? So like, tell me about yourself is probably going to be a question regardless of what field you're in or what area you're in. And getting feedback that's not from a computer can be useful with that. Um, we also do some LinkedIn development and review, salary negotiation, interests and values and skills assessment, long-term career planning, individualized development plans. We do, if it has to do with careers, it's likely that we do it. Um, yes, and that is it.